Sometimes when you are strolling down Bold Street you may happen to notice a vacant shop and if you do you probably won't even give it a second glance nor wonder why the premises happen to be empty. We are living in hard times and there is nothing unusual about the closure of a shop on Bold Street. But the premises I am referring to really could be called the Little Shop of Horrors. Let me explain why. In the 1970s the shop did well for a while because it was situated in a catchment area in very close proximity to that much missed emporium, the House of Holland. The shop in those days sold vacuum cleaners, televisions, five band radios, washing machines, various other electrical household items. The owners had obtained the lease in the spring and had found the shop quaint and welcoming, but as Christmas approached, strange incidents started happening. The lessee during this period was an Irishman by the name of Desmond, who bore a strong facial resemblance to the late Irish comedian Dave Allen. One foggy afternoon in early 1977 an old man came into the shop inquiring about an electric razor when he suddenly posed a curious question to Desmond. Has anything happened in here yet? he asked. How do you mean? Desmond asked. The old man said the building was haunted and that even as a lad he heard strange tales about the place. Always in the run up to Christmas they say, the pensioner remarked. That's why I asked. Desmond walked the eight feet into the stockroom to fetch the razor but when he returned to the counter the man had vanished and yet the bell over the door hadn't sounded and it was impossible to enter or leave the premises without the bell ringing. Then came the sound of an old man chuckling somewhere close by but still he was nowhere to be found. That night Desmond went home to his flat on Huskisson Street and he told his girlfriend Judy about the vanishing pensioner. She said she didn't believe in ghosts, it was all a load of rubbish, and she quickly changed the subject. She'd had what she called a bright idea. Hey, listen to this, Des, she said, barely containing her excitement. We're going to give up this flat and move into the rooms over the shop. And before Desmond could even object, she said, no more rent money's going to be wasted on this dump. That way we can save up and get married. Now she presented this as a fait accompli, Judy always managed to get her own way somehow. And so a week later she and Desmond moved all their furniture into the rooms above the Bold Street shop. She decided they would leave their old bed at the flat because there was a genuine Victorian double bed in the attic room of the Bold Street premises and they could use that. On Christmas Eve, while Judy was at work, Desmond went up to the gloomy attic bedroom looking for his car keys. It was late afternoon and it was already getting dark. Light was shining under the attic door and Desmond was surprised to see silhouettes in the slit of light where someone's feet were pacing to and fro. Who's that? he shouted nervously. Suddenly a substance that looked like blood began to ooze out from under the door forming a vast spreading pool of scarlet. Jesus, said Desmond, recoiling in horror and rapidly retracing his steps back down the stairs. He rang Judy at work and he told her what he'd seen, but she barely listened to a word he said. She was annoyed at him because she was due to attend a Christmas works party and he was holding her up. And well, when she arrived at the shop later that night, she greeted him with, go on then, let's see what you're rattling on about. She stormed up the stairs as she found no blood, no signs of anybody. You're come round the bend, was all she could say as she pushed past Desmond on the stairs. I'm not going round the bend, and I'm not sleeping in that attic tonight. I know exactly what I saw, Desmond roared, and Judy told him that was fine. He could sleep on the shop counter then. He kept to his word, and he spent an uncomfortable night on the shop floor that Christmas Eve. Meanwhile, up in the attic bedroom, Judy, still in a strop of what she took to be Desmond's wimpish behaviour, was about to have her own terrifying experience. She fell asleep at 1.15am, but some time later she was awakened by the violent rocking of the old bed. She felt it rise up, and the sensation of the ascent made her stomach turn over. It felt as if the bed had been lifted out of the attic and into the sky over Bold Street. 
freezing winds buffeted the blankets making them flap about and Judy clung onto the mattress and cried out desperately for help. She finally opened her eyes and to her amazement saw only the starry sky above her. The attic was gone, then she turned to her right and nearly jumped out of the bed. A malevolent looking man with red glowing skin was clutching the headboard at one hand and with the other hand he was supporting the iron bed frame under the palias. His pointed widow's peak hairline, evil penetrating eyes, turned up moustache and Van Dyke beard, perfectly framed the most hideous grin she had ever seen on a living face. She cringed with fear as the city light sparkled far below and the dark glistening Mersey snaked to the left. She hoped she was dreaming but she knew she wasn't. The bed suddenly tilted. Judy's tart and glad hot water bottle rolled off the blankets and disappeared into the blackness. Say you'll be mine, Judy, came the deep basso voice. Say you'll be mine. And he said it with a cackle of delight. The bed tilted again at a crazy angle and Judy slid, screaming down the bottom end, desperately grabbing at the bedding to save herself from certain death. But then, just as suddenly, it returned to a horizontal position. Judy was convinced that the red-skinned man was either the devil himself or one of his evil cohorts, and she suddenly remembered the rosary bead she kept under her pillow. She seized the rosary and she thrust the silver crucifix at the would-be abductor, saying, Jesus Christ, please save me! The crimson creature let out a yowl and suddenly he let go of the bed to shield his eyes from the cross. The bed plummeted towards the ground. Judy was now sick with apprehension, passed out. Whilst insensible she had a vivid dream of glowing angel-like figures supporting the bed as they guided it back down towards the attic. When she awoke she got up and ran downstairs to tell Desmond what had happened. Desmond convinced her the whole incident had been nothing more than a vivid nightmare, though in truth he had a serious misgiving about this but they both agreed that they would not be spending another day, never mind another night, at the shop. Now early the next morning, Christmas Day, while Desmond and Judy were on the way to the house of a relative with whom they hoped to stay, they passed St Luke's Church and there, lying burst on the steps, was Judy's tart and clad hot water bottle. Now at the time, as I recite this story, the little shop of horrors on Bull Street is currently empty and in the past I've had other reports of this enigmatic red fiend of Bold Street, as I call them. In 1985, two sisters, Kate and Megan, both in their thirties, decided to rent the premises, unaware of course of its reputation for being haunted. The sisters sold second-hand clothes from the shop Kate also made a bit of money selling her homemade jewellery. In the summer of 1985, a heavily pregnant Megan was taken to the maternity hospital, leaving her younger sister Kate to run the shop on her own for five days. On the second day, Kate stayed at the Bold Street shop and she decided to take a look at the dusty rooms upstairs. She finally reached the top of the house after finding most of the other rooms empty and she was surprised to find an old king-size bed up there and beneath it she found this battered looking portmanteau full of old vintage postcards from the Victorian and Edwardian era. There were a number of books in the old case including an 1881 copy of Oates's Biographical Dictionary and more curiously there was a black leather bound notebook of about 150 pages half of which were filled with neat copper plate writing now, fascinated by her find, Kate sat in the attic, poring over the faded brown writing in this book. The subject of the notebook was the Didyin. This is an Arab term for demons and elemental beings. From the first page of the book, Kate learned that the word genie is derived from the Arabic word Didyin. And as she read on, she noticed the handwriting became more and more erratic. And the word Shezeral was underlined and written in capital letters within the text at several points. Now, I've researched the many names of the demons of the jinn and Shezeral is not among them. What the word refers to is still a mystery to me.
Now as Kate struggled to decipher the wonky looking long hand, she was utterly absorbed by the task. She suddenly heard a sound behind her. It was like a creaking floorboard. Something or someone was now blocking out part of the daylight filtering into the attic via the skylight. Kate's heart missed a beat. She turned to see what she could only describe as a shimmering column of what looked like green smoke and at the top of this cylindrical vaporous mass a terrifying face was gazing at her. The face was reddish orange with piercing blue eyes, possibly pale green. The face also had the telltale turned up black moustache and a Van Dyke beard. Now Kate had difficulty getting to her feet as she was so afraid and she had to crawl on all fours to get out to the door. She finally got to her feet. She ran out of the attic as the walls began to reverberate with deep mocking laughter. She darted out of the shop without looking up and she burst into a religious bookshop just across the road where she told the man what she had just seen. Now this man believed this story without hesitation. Stay there love, I'll be back in a minute, he said, sitting her down behind the counter. And then he bravely on his own, crossed the road into the shop and he went up into the attic on his own. And when he came out about five minutes later he told Kate the thing she had seen was a demon who had been invited into the attic a long time ago. The man said he was a late preacher and he offered to perform a cleansing ceremony in the attic and Kate thanked him but declined his offer. When she told Megan what had happened, she admitted she too had heard strange sounds coming from the upper floors when she'd been alone in the shop. She hadn't told Kate, not wishing to frighten her. The sisters decided to move. In the 1990s, a man I shall call Ray, who ran a well-known shop in Bold Street, told me on several occasions how he and other members of his staff had spotted an eerie reddish face peering out from the second floor windows of the vacant shop opposite. Now at first Ray thought it was someone playing a prank because the person peeping out of the window looked as if he was wearing some Halloween mask of the devil. But a young member of Ray's staff who had much keener vision than him said it was no mask but the man's actual face and what's more, the face seems to float up to the window as if the person peeping out was levitating. The identity of the Red Fiend is still unknown. The notebook that Kate found in the haunted attic alluded to the Dien. And I can't help wondering if one of those diabolical spirits of Arabian legend had once been invoked in the attic of the haunted shop, perhaps during some arcane ritual. Now such rituals which open up portals to other realms are known to the serious occultist.